And I wanted to talk about this text this morning because it has to do with spiritual blessings. And the road that Elijah and Elisha took that day is a great example. There's four locations here, and I had you to, to repeat them as we read this, about where they went and why they went there. And I wanted to look at it in the sense of uh, the road to spiritual blessings. Now, if you got a Bible that's got a map in the back and you look there while I'm talking this morning, you're going to find that, uh, that Gilgal and Bethel are pretty close together there. And you're going to find uh, Jericho a little further over in Palestine there. And then you're going to find that uh, Jordan is a way back over there beyond uh, Gilgal and Bethel. And, uh, and each one of those places requires a certain amount of traveling to get there. They left Gilgal, the Bible said, and they went to these other places. So on the day that the Lord chose to take this prophet, Elijah, and uh, evidently he had spoken to him concerning this, and he had spoken to Elisha concerning this, and Elisha knew that the Lord was going to take him that day. Now, Elijah is one of those two great prophets, they believe, that uh, never tasted death. And uh, this is one that they believe is going to come back as one of the, the two great witnesses in the, uh, in the millennium reign there, and, uh, or premillennial, if you want to get down to basics there and ever how you interpret that. And uh, this, uh, the catching up of him is that event in which it is uh, it's recorded as a shadow or a type of things that is to come. The importance of this text has to deal with the fact that, that as you see Jesus rising in the last sight they have of him, as he is rising in the air, and uh, then the down or outpouring or the coming of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost is a symbol or a fulfillment of the symbolic uh, aspect of this scripture here. And uh, when we look at it in that sense, it begins to take shape. So the Old Testament event here is a symbol or a shadow of that which is to come. Now the Bible said in Hebrews 1 and 1 that in the, the former times that God spoke unto us by the prophets or through uh, the prophets to us. But in these last days has spoken unto us through his son or by his son. So the importance of the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament fulfillment in, in the last day is the coming of the Son of God. Now, we look back at that Old Testament prophet there, and we, I want you to just picture him for just a moment. God's messenger and the church today, we think of the pastor or the preacher as the messenger of God. In those days, they didn't have churches to go to. They didn't have... Uh, uh, they didn't have the opportunity to come together and worship like you and I did. And uh, so up in the, in the mountains there, they had places where they called them holy places, where they would go and they would commune with the Creator. Many of those places, and some of the places I'll mention here as we move through, became, uh, became uh, rocks of, uh, of uh, stumbling for Israel during their, their history. And the very places that were blessing, places of blessing like Gilgal and Bethel and uh, Jericho and even, even Jordan there, later on in their history became uh, rocks of, of tripping and uh, stumbling for them. And uh, they were tripped up there. But the prophet is the messenger of God. He was in tune with God. Now, why God chooses men, I don't know. He could come, he could send angels, he could send down, uh, he could speak to us like he did on the day that Jesus was baptized. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. He can do that. We know that he can and he will. And, and God often speaks to people uh, in, in different ways. And uh, I've had people tell me, he said, Brother Hershey, I was doing so and so and one day the Lord just spoke to me. How many has ever had that kind of experience? Let me see your hand. Now, if you've never had that kind of experience, 
you, you may not know what we're talking about. I remember the day that God called me uh, to just uh, lay aside everything that I was doing and be a missionary. When I sat up on the edge of that bed that morning in that little old house in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and the Lord spoke to me and said, this is the rest of your life. And if you're ever going to do anything for me, you need to do it now. Well, I, I said, now, Lord, if that's you, uh, I'm thinking about my wife and that little, uh, at that time, about 12-month-old baby that I had in the, in the kitchen in there. Mama's fixing breakfast for me, and I'm sitting on the edge of that bed getting ready to go to work, and the Lord's talking to my heart. If I'm going to ever do anything, I need to do it now. Now, that may not have been this voice from heaven like that, a trumpet, but it was that small, still voice. You know the one I'm talking about, don't you? That speaks to the inner man. Well, in the day of the prophet, God spoke, and he spoke in sometimes in great ways. He, uh, whenever uh, uh, the old prophet called Israel to, to repent there, and they made the altar, and, and they did all the prophets of Baal there, they, they, you know, they called on their God, and he didn't answer. But when he called on the God of Israel, uh, called the Lord God that created heaven and earth, he answered by fire, hallelujah, and the offering was consumed, and the water that was poured on the altar was consumed, and everything was consumed around him. And so this God is a God who answers, but he's also one who speaks. And he spoke in the old days by the prophet. And whenever the people would want to hear from the Lord, they would go to these places and they would listen to what the prophet had to say. And many times while, while they're yet coming, and he would get a message from God. You remember whenever old Saul is out looking for the animals. Do you remember that? Yeah. And uh, Saul gets there. He said, well, uh, let me tell you why you're here. And he told him, he said, you've been looking for them. He said, I know exactly where they're at. You know, the Lord done told me where they're at. So he sends him on his way. But while he's there, he, he gives him a message from God. So God speaks to them in areas. Now, in Gilgal, there was a school of prophets. Now, somebody said, well, what do you need a school for? Well, uh, sometimes some people just need schooling in how to get in touch with God. Somebody say church. Do you know what church is for? Church is to help you to get in touch with God. Hello, are you with me this morning? Now, it's cold outside, but just let your mind wander here a little bit and just kind of warm it up to the idea that we come to church to try to get in touch with God. We come here to learn about what God has done in the past. And chances are, if he's done it in the past, he'll do it in the future. Somebody say in the future. Let me tell you, he can touch you this morning and speak to you right here, right now, as he did in days of old, and he spoke to, to those through the prophets. So in Gilgal, there's a school of prophets. Well, if you go a little bit further over there to Bethel, there's another school of prophets. When they get over there, there's a... And uh, if you go on down to Jericho, there's another school of the prophets. And when you get down to Jordan, there's a school, at least 50 we find there, that are standing afar off and they're watching this scene here. So we go from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho and back to Jordan there. In each one of these places, he finds young men or older men who are trying to learn about how God is working and what God is doing. Now, the prophet Elijah, no doubt, is very old at this time. We don't know exactly uh, just how to, how to pin down his age here, but if we looked at him, I can just imagine. I want you to imagine with me that he looks just about like Brother Cracker over here. He's got that old uh, shiny beard, you know, and, uh, and the young man that's with him is, uh, has less hair. In fact, we know a little bit about Elisha. The one thing is he didn't have much hair on his head. So he may have looked more like Cracker than, than Elijah did, but he had that big white beard. And uh, he has received a message from God, and God is saying to him, you're going to be taken away. I'm going to take you away. And so today is the day that he sets out to go to say goodbye to all these young men. Now, these young men... From time to time, and no doubt this was a circuit preacher, he would go from one school to the other, and he would tell them what the Lord had said, and he would teach them about getting in touch with God. And so this day, he has a message from God that God is going to take him away. So he sets out 
from Gilgal. Now, I want you to just look at Gilgal for just a moment, and let's talk about Gilgal. You know, Gilgal is that place when Israel was to, uh, uh, for the first time, once they crossed the River of Jordan, their first encampment, if you look in the book of Joshua, you're going to find that their first encampment was in a place called Gilgal. Now, I want you to th stop and think about this now. Now, in the desert, for all of those years, those some 40 years they were out there in the desert, God had fed them and taken care of them and give them clothes to wear and shoes that wouldn't wear out. Think about it now. In the desert, God is their every provider. They have water in the desert. When there was no water, what did God do? He opened a rock and he let the water pour out. So they had water in the desert. They had protection out there in the desert. And they had food out there. But they also had judgments out there in the desert. Because out there they learned how to trust God. Amen. They learned that there's some things you don't do and there's some things you do. And God is teaching them. And in this school of the desert is a very difficult place. But whenever they come back to the river of Jordan and God speaks to Joshua concerning crossing the Jordan, Joshua prophesies to them and tells them exactly what they're going to do. He said, when the, when the soles of the feet of the prophet, uh, of the, the priest, touch that water's edge, you're going to cross over. How many believe that God is going to cross us over one of these days? Let me see. Let me tell you, it's sooner than you think. Amen. Your feet, like the feet of those old priests, whenever God touched them and they stuck their first toe in that water, it began to roll back and they crossed over there. They went from there to a place called Gilgal. And in Gilgal, God had provided food and everything they needed. They ceased, the manna ceased in, in Gilgal. And the food they ate right there, the, the fruit was on the vine. The fields and the harvest fields were there to feed the multitude. We're talking uh, a million or two million people. We have no idea exactly how many there. We, we have a lot of scholars try to put a number on it. I don't know, but I can say well over a million people out there. And God has provided everything for them in Gilgal to supply all of their needs. How many believes that God supplies all of your need? Now, look at this now. God is sending Elijah away from, the Bible said, away from Gilgal. He left from there. Now, wouldn't it have been good to just stay in Gilgal? Think about it. Now, you're on a, a spiritual journey here, but it is so good to stay in Gilgal where there's plenty to eat and everything is all right, isn't it? Yeah. Now, there's a school and there's a church and everything's going good. Let's just stay in Gilgal. But every once in a while, God will pick out somebody and get them out of Gilgal on, and get them on the road to a spiritual blessing. Hello, are you with me now? Are you following me? Now, God may be speaking to you this morning to get out of Gilgal. And don't, God forbid that I should come to this church and call anybody to prophesy and leave this church. But who's to say that God is not calling one of you this morning? In fact, we've already had one this morning who was out of the church doing the work of the Lord. And who's to say this morning that God is not moving you from Gilgal where there's manna where there is plenty of food and where there's everything is all right and the house of the prophets and the things are going good in Gilgal. But God said, I want you to leave Gilgal and I want you to go down to where the Bible said Bethel. I want you to notice too that he said there, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Somebody say the Lord. You see, if it's I go, it's one thing, but the Lord sending me is another. Now, I don't go to Ecuador because it's fun. It ain't fun anymore. It used to be interesting, 
And at one time, it was just a great, you know, just a great challenge to see if I could do it. That's when I was a lot younger. But it ain't fun anymore because when you get old, things ain't as much fun as they used to be. It just takes a lot more energy to do that. And this man, Elijah, is an older fellow here, and it ain't easy to travel when you're older. Because God sends you and puts you through different experiences for your own benefit. Praise God. So God said, now I want you to leave Gilgal, and I want you to go to Bethel. Now, somebody said, well, what happened down at Bethel? Why go to Bethel? Now, how many of you remember the story of Jacob? <clears throat> you remember when Jacob left home? He was, he was kind of getting out of town in a hurry. He done got that birthright, and uh, he, was, uh, he, he, he just kind of had to move on. In fact, he was looking for a wife when he... And when he left, I believe, and Esau was kind of looking for him with blood in his eye, and he had to get out of town in a hurry. Well, when he got to a place called Bethel, somebody say Bethel, he got there, and he laid down that night, and he pulled up a, a couple of rocks there, and one of those rocks he put down for a pillow. And if you've ever slept uh, on a rock in a hard place, this is kind of where he was at. I don't know if he, during the night, he had a lot of, uh, of rest or not, but I know one thing, when he woke up in the morning, he had had a tremendous spiritual experience Amen. with the Lord. Amen. And in that dream that night, he saw a ladder extended from heaven down to where he was at. And he saw angels or messengers of God ascending and descending in that place. And it was there that old Jacob made a covenant with the Lord. Somebody say covenant. You know what a covenant is? You make a pact with God. And he said, surely God was in this place and I just didn't know it. And he called this place the house of God. <laughs> Here we are. We left Gilgal where there's a lot to eat. We've left Gilgal where everything was taken care of in the school of the prophets there. And we come down to Bethel where it's the house of God. Somebody the house of God. This is where it happens, let me tell you. This is where God opens the doors of heaven and, and we go up and we come down and we hear from God and God sends his message down here and we hear from the Lord. This is God's house and Bethel is a good place to be. Somebody say good place. You see, every once in a while, God puts us in a good place. Oh, let me tell you, a good place. That, that's where the palm trees are are blowing in the wind and there's plenty to drink there and there's plenty to eat. Everything is all right. Yes. Bethel is a good place. And whenever you're there and where old Jacob had made that covenant with God, he said, God, if you will bless me, this is what I'm going to do. How many remember the time that you said, God, if you'll save me, this is what I'll do. Let me see your hand. You see, I remember where I was at. And I didn't know how to get saved. All I knew is that I needed to pray and I got on that altar and an old boy climbed down there with me and he said, Brian, tell Jesus you love him. I said, Jesus, I love you. Hallelujah. He said, now, tell him to forgive you. And I said, Jesus, forgive me. Yeah. He said, now, do you believe he heard me? I said, yes, I believe he's heard me. He said, now, thank him for it. And I began to praise God and thank Jesus. And all of a sudden, that old weight of sin began to lift on my life. And I walked out of there. Listen, I was walking on air. I believe I could have walked right on like old Elijah, right on into heaven. Hallelujah. Because whenever you have had that burden of sin relieved and you know that you know that you've been saved, everything, when you hear from God, you know, hallelujah, that everything is all right. So Bethel is a good place. Bethel is a good place, the house of God. This is where you hear from God. But he wouldn't let him stay there. What did he say? He said, now, uh, the Bible said, and they came to Jericho. Jericho is that place where Israel, once they had come in to the, the, uh, the land of promise, this is their first great trial and their first great battle. Now, there's AI out there, but we'll get to there later. But Jericho is the first real trying of their faith. This is where that they needed intervention from God. So there's old Joshua looking over the city and he's wondering now, how am I going to handle this thing? What am I going to do? I'm the general in charge. And when you're the man in charge, 
You need all the help you can get. Let me tell you. And God's got the help. Somebody say amen. amen. You see, when he's looking the situation over, all of a sudden he looks up and there's a man standing over there with a sword in his hand. Uh-oh. He looks him over and he says, are you for us or against us? Y'all know what that means around here, don't you? Yeah. I heard uh, Brother Cracker say some of that this morning. Are you for us or against us? That means are you, you gonna, are you for us or are you against us? Now, when you're for us, everything's all right. But if you're against us, now Joshua's ready to do battle with him. Yes, he didn't know at that particular time that he was an angel. He just wanted to know which side are you on. Amen. Because you see, already the spies had gone out and already he knew about the land and already Rachel uh, had uh, told those men, said, now when you take the land, don't forget. You know, and, and I said Rachel, Rahab. And uh, they had already tied the string in the window. That scarlet thread that was going to guarantee her survival and all that was in there. And the men said, now, if you leave this house, your blood is on your own head. But if you stay in this house, and that scarlet thread there is going to protect you. How many know what that scarlet thread stands to mean this morning? You see, that stands for the blood. And if the blood is over you, everything is all right. Somebody said everything's all right. You see, whenever you got the blood, everything is all right. For without the cleansing of the blood, you're still in your sin. But when the blood has been applied and the blood is on your door, everything is okay. And there we are at Jericho. This first great battle is going to go on there. And they marched around and they sounded the trumpets and they shouted. And the walls fell down and they took this great city because God said to him, this king, I have given you this city and the king and everything here is yours, Joshua. What a great place to be. Somebody say uh, Jericho's. And I'll tell you as a church this morning that God can give you the means to overcome. He will bless you and he will enlarge your camp. Amen. Until you're able to overcome any and all circumstances. For he's given us the power hallelujah, to do just that. So then the Lord sent him to Jordan. When I read that and I got to thinking about this, I said, well, this is backing up. They've already come across Jordan. They encamped in Gilgal. They went to Bethel, the house of God. They went to Jericho where they had that first great battle and won. And here he is backing up. He's going back to Jordan. The Lord has sent me to Jordan. Well, there was another school down there. And he had to say goodbye to that little school of prophets down there. But he also had a lesson for them. That what he'd been telling them all these years about getting in con contact with God and staying in contact with God is that God was about to demonstrate his power to them. And so Elijah and Elisha come to the water's edge and Elijah takes his mantle off and he rolls it up in a bundle and he strikes the water. And what happens? The water rolled back. You remember it rolled back when those priests put their toe in it and it rolled back and they went in. And here it is rolling back and the man of God or the men of God walk across on dry land. Now, what is Jordan? Well, let me tell you what Jordan represents in the scripture. Jordan is one of those moments in which all of history hinges in your spiritual life as well as in the life of the history of Israel. Until they crossed Jordan, they lived in what they call the wilderness of sin, S-I-N. The Bible spells it two ways, S-I-N and Z-I-N. But our life is not to be lived in the wilderness. Jordan is that when we leave the old life and come into the new life. 
Every one of us, when we come to this altar, wherever our altar was at, it may have been in your car, riding down the road. It may have been at a jail cell. It may have even been somewhere that no one knew about. It's just you and God, and, and you took that leap of faith. You stepped across Jordan into the land of promise, and that was for every good gift that God has for you is on the other side. There's a Gilgal on the other side. There's a Bethel on the other side. There's a Jericho on the other side over there. Every one of these is for you. God has promised them good gifts. Hallelujah. And then when they crossed over Jordan, he looked at him and said, what do you want me to do? What is it that you want me to do? That's whenever we get down to that verse 9. Let's read it again. And it came to pass that when they were going over, that Elijah said, Elijah said unto Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion. Somebody say double portion. Let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Mm. You know what he said? He said, you asking a hard thing, son. But you know, with God, ain't nothing hard, is it? You know what he was asking for? He had seen this man do all of these miracles. He just wanted twice as much. And they tell me that if you will look at the life of Elisha and you compare miracle for miracle, that he did exactly twice as much as his boss man did as his father. Right. And then I began to look at the man. We see him there as Elijah is taking away the last glimpse he had, the chariots of fire and the horsemen there, and they lift him up and he's going out of sight. And he cries out, oh, my father. And as he cries out, the mantle falls. And that old dusty mantle, that old ragged outer coat, that he had had over his shoulders all of those years. And he picks it up. And all he's got is the mantle. But he's asked for something bigger than the mantle. He's asked for something worthwhile. And that is a portion that is twice as big as the man he'd been serving. I looked at Elisha and I thought about where God called him from. Called him from the fields out there when the man of God came by. And he called him from plowing in the fields and he put that mantle on him. Let me tell you, when God lays the mantle on you,